Greetings and welcome to the second part of lecture 5 of Tripoli 23. Um, last for the previous part, we talked about boundary conditions in a conductor. And as you, as you can see, actually, there, there's no electric field uh, inside the conductor or electric flux for that matter because of the properties of conductor where the charges uh, tend to gather into the surface of the conductors. Okay. So the consequence of that is the, ele the electric field uh, tangent to the boundary of the conductor in free space is zero. So at the immediate boundary, um, there is uh, just a normal component of your electric field and that results into this. Okay? So your uh, conductor actually forces, your conductor actually forces your uh, your region to be an equipotential surface like this one conductor uh, forces the electric field to be always uh, normal to the surface okay. so it uh, it happens at any charge distribution at any charge distribution always there's uh, the conductor will always uh, force the electric field to be normal to the surface okay. And this system actually is the uh, half of uh, this system right here. So this system is kind of equivalent to this system. Where you have a negative charge that absorbs the electric field of your positive charge. And between them, a, an equipotential surface can be found. So recall the lecture on equipotential surfaces. So you can see at this point, well, uh, we have a straight line for an or as, uh, uh, infinite sheet as an equipotential surface. And it's just the same as basically having a conductor bet uh, between them. Okay? And taking out one half and still the same. Taking out this one and still the same. Okay? So actually, if we have an uh, infinite sheet, we can actually safely insert that infinite sheet between these two charges okay, without disturbing the electric field in the region. Okay, so we can insert this. So we can insert this here and it won't disturb the electric field lines in that region. Okay, so, But if we have a uh, positive charge that's always, uh, as we know, as always radiating so the positive charge always radiates electric field. If we put a conductor near it, so let me redraw that. So if we put a conductor near this positive charge, it forces the electric field to be normal to the surface. So it kind of attracts uh, the electric field, which is the same function as a negative charge. It attracts the electric field towards it. Okay. And as you can see, this positive charge kind of created an image here and uh, the opposite uh, sign. Okay. So kind of like uh, basically this creates an image right here. And to solve this system, we can actually use the method of images. So how do you determine where the image is placed? So again, consider a point charge at some uh, x naught at the xy plane and an infinite conducting sheet at the yz plane. Let me try to draw that. Yeah, something like this. Okay, so it's not really... There you go. So you have some charge here. Some charge here and you have an infinite conducting sheet right here. Okay. So it's an infinite conducting sheet. Then there's some image at the other side. Let me draw that with a different color. There's some image at the different side, at the other side here at a some position x naught prime. And that charge here is Q prime. Okay. 
So, uh, if we get the voltage, uh, the potential at this region at x is equal to 0, we set that to be 0. Right? The potential there would be 0 for simplicity. Set up the equation, then we get the potential function equal to this. Okay? And we let V be the 0. We let this be grounded and this uh, position at x is equal to 0, then we get this expression right here. Okay? And which leads us to two solutions. If uh, this q prime is equal to negative q and x naught prime is equal to x naught, okay? so that's a valid solution for this equation, but it's actually not valid in real life because it doesn't result to an electric field as we expected from here. It will only be valid if this is also still negative q, but this is equal to negative x naught, which is uh, the same distance away from the uh, infinite plane, infinite conducting plane, but on the other side of the plane. So there's kind of like a mirror image here. So we can generalize that to a charge distribution also. So any configuration above an infinite ground plane uh, can have an image due to the uh, conducting plane between them. Okay? So it becomes something like this. So this is mirrored at the other side with a negative magnitude. Negative, uh, sorry, negative the magnitude of the charge. This is also mirrored, mirrored on the other side with also negative of the magnitude. Okay? So this is actually equivalent to this and uh, note that the line between them is you, uh, your zero or your uh, zero potential or the ground. Right. So notice that this is grounded right here. So it's only applicable actually to infinite conducting planes. Uh, other conducting shapes actually have different rules. Right. But uh, if uh, it's not for this course, um, it's basically uh, for an advanced course. If you're interested, you can enroll in that course. I don't know if it will be offered next semester but anyway. Okay, so that is your method of images. So that's the effect of a conductor. Okay. Uh, and the gist of it basically is that your uh, electric field is always perpendicular to your conductor boundary which kind of makes your conductor boundary an equipotential surface. So if you introduce an, a conductor in a system of charges, it forces that region to be equipotential. Okay? It could disturb the fields. Okay? So if you recall, if we have a positive charge, electric field is always rigidly outward, but if we introduce a conductor, you have disturbed the path of the fields right here. By making the fields always perpendicular, then, well, basically, you just introduced a disturbance in the field. I feel a disturbance in the force. No, I'm just kidding. Star Wars reference, if you don't know. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So now, let's move on to another material, which is your insulators. Or in uh, other terms, it's your dielectric. Okay. The fundamental difference between your dielectric and conductors is that your uh, electrons are actually... Uh, strongly bounded in the atom. Okay, so um, why is it that way? So, well, uh, con uh, your insulators actually are kind of like your complete atoms. Okay, so um, most insulators are built by um, built using atoms that are uh, that have completed their valence band. Okay. So, re recall uh, Lewis structures. You need to complete 8 electrons in your valence band to be called a complete atom. Okay. So, that means all the electrons inside an insulating uh, atom is actually bounded within the atom, doesn't want to go out because the atom actually is already complete, doesn't want to go, basically. But anyway, okay. so that is your insulator. And uh, recall that... Uh, your general structure, so not really exactly the structure of an atom. This is a spherical. Let's assume it's spherical. The nucleus is at the middle. 
Makes sense. Since it's the nucleus and you have electrons orbiting that nucleus. But if you apply an electric field, if you apply an electric field, actually the center of the electrons move to a certain point and the nucleus moves away. Okay. It moves in the direction of the electric field and the electrons move uh, towards the source of the electric field right here. Okay. So the nucleus, uh, recall, is positively charged since it contains protons and neutrons only. Okay. And this is actually equivalent to, to something like this. A positive charge Q is bounded with a negative charge Q with a distance D. Okay. And this is actually what we call a dipole. Okay. So this electric field polarized the atoms by pushing away the nucleus and the electron. Okay. And then creates what we call a dipole moment between uh, within your atom. And that is P is equal to QD. P is a dipole moment. Q is the charge. Okay. And D is equal to the distance. Okay. The distance vector from your negative to your positive. So it's negative to positive. So you create a polarization. So the stronger the electric field, the larger actually the separation between your nucleus and your center of electrons. Sorry. So there you go. If you increase the electric field, the stronger the separation, the stronger the dipole moment. Okay. And if you apply a, an electric field strong enough, you can actually break the atom. Okay. The, uh, the electrons will be able to go out okay, and flow, making your insulators conduct electrons. What is the price? Your, your uh, dielectric breaks down. And this is what we call a dielectric breakdown. It actually occurs when lightning strikes. So air is an insulator, but uh, due to the presence of uh, charged particles in your clouds, and you have your uh, equipotential ground plane, which is the earth, okay, so basically a very large voltage in the air produces lightning, because of dielectric breakdown. So the uh, strong charge uh, buildup in your clouds creates a uh, separation enough, be uh, uh, separation between your nucleus and your electron enough that your electron can actually flow from the ground to the cloud. Okay? So that is uh, the process of dielectric breakdown. Anyway, so let's move back here. So your electric field causes a dipole moment between uh, within your atom. The stronger the electric field, the stronger the dipole moment. So that is just one atom. As you know, your insulators are created uh, are built with a lot of atoms. So these dipoles align due to the electric field. The dipoles kind of align due to the electric field right here. So seems like at this point there's a buildup of positive charges. Okay. In this surface here, there's some form of negative charges between them. So the dipoles are aligned such that there is some form of positive and a negative between them. Okay. Since the positive charges are uh, repelled by the electric field and the Negative charges are attracted to the source of the electric field. So we get the net induced dipole moment, which is the vector sum of all dipole moments of individual molecules within the electric. So it's something like this. Okay. So uh, we define then uh, the net polarization per unit volume. So this is the net dipole moment per unit volume. Just let volume approach zero. Okay. That means you get the dipole moment at each point in the volume instead of just a some volume right here. Okay. Let me draw that again so that would be clear. So if we want to get the net induced dipole moment, 
then we get the dipole mo total dipole moment within a volume. We shrink that volume to a point. We get the polarization vector P. Okay. The presence of this dipole actually uh, alters the relationship between D and E. Because of this dipole, your uh, electric flux is actually enhanced. Okay. The electric flux is enhanced. Okay. It becomes epsilon E plus your polarization moment or, or your polariz sorry, polarization P. For uh, isotropic materials, so isotropic uh, materials, so it's a special type of, uh, not really special type, but it's a type of material that uh, basically lets your dipole or your polarization, uh, it makes your polarization uh, say in the same direction as your electric field. Okay. Your polar uh, for isotropic materials, uh, P and E are linear. That means P is in the same direction as E. Okay, so uh, it's equal to P equals chi E times epsilon sub zero. Okay. So where chi E is your electric susceptibility. Combining these two equations, we get D is equal to epsilon E plus chi E times epsilon E times E, which becomes this. Okay, And this expression inside is actually your relative permittivity okay so this whole expression is equal to the permittivity of that uh, region times your electric field which is equal to this expression right here your epsilon sub zero which is the permittivity of free space multiplied by some epsilon sub r okay, epsilon sub r is the relative permittivity of the material. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this from your physics 72. So for perfect dielectrics, that is an isotropic dielectric and it doesn't, uh, be, it doesn't let uh, electrons flow. So the boundary conditions for perfect dielectrics is something like this. There is no charge collected at any point in your perfect dielectric. Therefore, the, the fluxes, okay, so the flux between the boundaries should be equal, okay, since there is no charge in the boundary. And uh, however, the electric field is not necessarily zero within the electric because of the presence of charges inside. Okay, unlike the conductor, well, the conductor we have no flux inside, but for a dielectric we could have flux inside. Okay. And that makes your uh, tangent uh, tangent electric field here equal to the tangent electric field right here. Okay. Okay. So that is the property of perfect dielectrics. So the perfect dielectrics doesn't force your electric field to be... Uh, perpendicular to it however it enhances the electric flux okay, so if you enter a field of uh, if you enter a region in space if your uh, field enters a region in space that is not free uh, that is an insulator a dielectric the flux increases as compared to free space okay so there you go So for next part, we have semiconductors. So semiconductors, as you know, there is a band gap between your valence band and your conduction band. Okay. But it's very, it's smaller than your insulators, which makes uh, the electrons able to cross from the valence band to the conduction band. Okay. So... Um, such materials are actually found into uh, in your uh, group four of your uh, periodic table. Is it group four? Sorry, group six of your periodic table, which is composed of silicon, germanium, carbon, etc., etc. So most conductors are made from germanium or silicon. Okay. 
So the energy bands do not overlap, but uh, sufficiently small energy uh, can be ach it's achievable. You can uh, let your electron jump from your valence band to your conduction band. With that, you actually leave a hole in your valence band where electrons can uh, occupy from other parts of the valence band. And kind of like the hole is moving towards some direction. Okay. So if the electron is promoted from valence to conduction, it leaves a hole. Okay. If you apply an electric field in your semiconductor, the electron will flow in the different direction of your electric field while the hole is actually uh, going, with this, going to the same direction as the electric field. How does a hole even move? It's an empty space. So, however, we have electrons from on the valence band. Okay, so it's full of electrons. Due to the electric field, the electron from here moves to the space here. And uh, with that, it creates another space in this that becomes a hole. This becomes an electron. And uh, electron next to it could, occu oct could occupy it again. So that's kind of like your hole moving towards this direction right here. Okay. So this uh, material actually has a varying conductivity because uh, it depends on the movement of the charge carriers. Uh, it also depends on how much free electrons are generated from the valence band. So that's your semiconductors. In some cases, actually, if the conditions are right, um, electrons can jump from valence to conduction. But if you don't meet those conditions, well, electrons will just get stuck in the valence band and there will be no free uh, electron or free hole to carry your to carry your uh, current. That's why it's called semiconductors. It will only conduct if there are certain conditions that are met. Okay? That's why it's semi conductor doesn't conduct or it conducts all right so these are important materials in your uh, computers actually your computers are filled with them your phones are filled with them and you'll learn more about them in the next semester if given that you pass this subject anyway so how to get the conductivity of semiconductors um, if you apply an electric field your holes will move uh, along the direction of the electric field. Your electrons will move opposite the direction of the electric field. And uh, basically, this hole creates a current density. Because of its movement, electrons will have a current density of itself. We add them, you get the total current density. And uh, just substitute the, these expressions, you get this. And by the definition that J equals sigma E, just uh, factor out E, the other side, get the uh, conductivity of a semiconductor dependent on holes and electrons. Okay, so some notes from the equation, we can, act we can actually improve the conductivity of a semiconductor by adding what we call impurities or doping in the crystal structure. This uh, impurity actually increases the amount of holes or electrons depending on the type of impurity. So there, uh, there are impurities that increase holes and there are impurities that increase electrons. But more on that in, the, in your Tripoli 41. Okay. So you have more electrons, you have more conductivity. Okay. If you have more electrons, we call that an N-type material. More holes, you have a P-type material. So uh, if we uh, actually combine these materials, you create your transistors, your diodes, and your, um, your MOSFETs, your CMOS, and uh, basically semiconductor technologies just focus on combining these materials to create weird devices. But that is for your uh, Tripoli 41. So this is actually the basics of that. The boundary conditions for a semiconductor, so at the surface, um, there are bound and free charges. So um, the boundary conditions hold true to their form and there are no alterations 
in your boundary conditions actually it's still the same right here if there's a charge uh, density between the bound in the boundary then your uh, your electric flux will hold accordingly and as always if there's a tangent electric field it will just follow that tangent electric field okay so that's the end of this part of the lecture if you have any questions again just comment in uh, your concerns co uh, questions below in the comment section I'll be, um, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I've, I, uh, my phone always notifies me if there are comments and I try to answer them as soon as possible. So don't hesitate to ask. Okay? So um, if, if, you, if you have uh, questions, you can always ask uh, about this topic, of course, not on any other question. Okay? So if, um, with that, again, we end the lecture. I'll see you when I see you.